Well, good morning. I am coming to you today pre-recorded because I am under quarantine. Yes, I had a close contact and, uh, well, we just want to be safe. And of course, I want to always make sure that you know that we're watching out for you as well. So we thought, hey, let's pre-record this so that we can stay in series. We're in our series, The Seven Churches of the Revelation. And today, we're going to be talking about the Church of Philadelphia. And yes, we're going to finish this one today. So you can go to your notes, and we're going to be following along with that. And of course, if you've missed any of these messages up till now, all of these are on demand, and I highly recommend that you would go back, watch them, because as the book of Revelation tells us, right in the first chapter, there is a blessing for anyone who hears the words of Revelation read to them and to those who read it. And of course, we know why. Because once you read the book, you realize the revelation of Jesus. It changes everything, which brings us to our thread. Our thread is simply this. The revelation of Jesus unravels the knots in my mind and heart. You see, the revelation of Jesus is the kingdom of God breaking into our temporal kingdom. And when God's kingdom breaks into our kingdom, specifically my life, I know that the knots begin unraveling at that point. I begin realizing that the things that I thought were true, that the things of Jesus coming into my life are now making those things uh, unravel in a better way so that I can truly understand it in perspective to the kingdom of God. And so the revelation of Jesus, and especially here in this book, is going to help people in the first century around the year AD 92, 94, when this book was written, who are under severe persecution. Some have already died and many others will. And here we have God writing to his people through John the apostle. He is on the island of Patmos and well, he is making rocks for Rome. He's there because it's a prison colony. And he's there being persecuted, imprisoned by the emperor himself. And so he's there, but God says, John, I want you to write these letters to these churches, these seven prominent churches. And these seven churches represent all churches in all generations. And so all of the words for each of the churches are meant to be understood by all of us, even in this century in our generation as well. Because when we read them, if they apply to you, if they apply to me, then they apply. It is the words of the kingdom of God breaking in to our kingdom. And I love that the revelation of Jesus has come, that God wants us to have clarity about the lives we're living. And so our message thread for today, specifically from the church of Philadelphia, which is the one we're looking at, is this. Jesus wants to commend you. Now, I know that may sound kind of obvious, but often we don't think about Jesus and my relationship with him in this way. So often we think of the guilt that we carry. And honestly, guilty people feel guilty a lot. And so when we come before the Lord, we think, oh, this is what it's always about. And I'm working through these issues with God. And I get that. But you know, there comes a point when we, when we need to recognize too that we're not just dealing with these issues of guilt, things that I actually did when I am present with the Lord, when I allow him to speak into my heart and my mind and I, I'm doing my time in the chair, that devotion time with God. No, 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 what God really wants and what Jesus really wants to say is he wants to commend you. We've been reading through these first churches as we've been going through each one of them. And Jesus had something to say to each one of them. And he was telling most of those churches that you need to repent. You need to turn away from the direction you're moving in and turn back closer to me. Well, for this church in Philadelphia, he has only commendation for them. This is the church 
that Jesus comes to and he says, I don't have anything to correct you with. I only have good things to say. And so what I wanna do is I wanna start unpacking this passage because when I read this passage, it's truly the passage to an amazing group of people. We wonder, we wonder who are the people and, and what do we know about them that Jesus would have only commendation for? Well, this is the group that we get to hear those words given to. So we wanna unpack this. But when I look at the words to the Church of Philadelphia, honestly, what comes to my mind is a cycling team. And you may say, what on earth are you talking about? Well, cycling is a sport that I absolutely love because I love to cycle recreationally. And no, I can't win a race. I am way too slow for that. But I do love to watch cycling races, cycling tours. The Tour de France is one that I have watched for years. And honestly, I'll watch from beginning to end. And often the coverage for those could be two, two and a half hours, sometimes three. And so I will uh, very often watch all of it <laughs> through the month of July. And when I do this, um, there are things that you begin to notice and you recognize. And do you know that there are probably about 120 riders that will start each of these races, but there's actually only about six to eight riders who can actually win it. You see, even in the beginning, most of the people know that they're not gonna win it, but these six to eight riders are the one who will. And in reality, most years, there's only about four riders who are actually contenders. And when I read this passage, I think about those contenders on the races. The way the tour works is that it is a 21-day tour. They get one rest day. And for each of those days, they're going to ride somewhere between 90 and 140 kilometers every single day. They'll do flats, they'll go into the mountains, the Pyrenees, the Alps, and they will suffer through. And that's one of the things that I love to watch is these men suffer up these mountains on their bicycles. It's, it's quite an amazing thing because I know I could never do it. So I love watching them do it though. But one of the things you realize is that these contenders, once they get to the end of their stage and they keep track of time throughout the whole race, they get to the end of the stage and what they have is an earpiece. And there is a coach that's in the earpiece and he's been talking to this writer all day long. Now he may be four to six hours on that bike that day. But what is it that that coach is telling him? He's saying a lot of things. Hey, there's a mountain coming up. There's a hill coming up. You're on pace. You're off pace. You lost a rider, but so-and-so is going to come up. But towards the end, towards the end of each of those stages, the coach is in his ear. And one of the things that he's doing is he is encouraging out the strength of that rider. I'll tell you what else he's doing. He is acknowledging the pain and the suffering that that rider has already been through in that stage of the race. He's acknowledging the pain and the suffering that he's going through right now on that mountain. And he's also, he's also acknowledging the sacrifice that is still to come that he's gonna have to go through in order to finish this part of the race, this stage of the race. He's also reminding him why his last efforts and every last drop of strength that he has needs to be expended because he's also helping him visualize. Visualize being on the podium, receiving the prize, the reward, the commendation that he's gonna get when he wins this whole thing. You see, that coach is there encouraging him, acknowledging him, reminding him the why that he started this whole thing in the first place, and also to help him visualize what the end goal is. Picture yourself there, and it'll make the suffering and the pain you're in right now all worth it. And so as we read through this passage, I want you to hear the words of Jesus encouraging you, acknowledging, reminding us why, and helping us to visualize the great moment of Revelation 20, when Jesus brings the last word and the last action, he wants to get us to that moment 
That's what Jesus is doing. And he's doing that very thing for the church at Philadelphia. Here's what it says. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. And we remember that this is not a literal angel. This is, this is the pastor of that church. It simply means messenger. That's what angel means, messenger. To the pastor of this church, I'm writing this to you and I want you to read this to your congregation and then I want you to teach them about these words. What do we know about Philadelphia? We know that Philadelphia was known as Little Athens. Now, the reason they named Philadelphia Little Athens is because there were so many temples in this city. Now, that we've already been talking about all the different temples in the city of Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, but there are a lot of them here in Philadelphia. And so the people here are very zealous in their worship of so many of the gods of Rome. And so it's called Little Athens. We also know that Philadelphia is literally built <laughs> on the edge of a volcano that is not active, but it's not inactive. And so they are, um, they are there and they're experiencing earthquakes and tremors on a regular basis. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but it, they are there specifically because the land is so rich because of what's come out of that volcano over the years. We also know that Jesus Jesus has no correction for this church. He simply is saying, you are amazing people. You're amazing people, church at Philadelphia. What do we know about this church? Well, we believe it's likely the smallest of all seven of the churches of the Revelation that Jesus is writing to. We also know uh, that is very likely the people that make up the prominent members of this church and the majority of this church are people who are Messianic Jews, meaning they are Jews who recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And because of that, they are no longer welcome in the synagogue of Philadelphia. And we're gonna find that they are actually uh, the people of the synagogue in Philadelphia are antagonistic against them. And because of that, uh, we see the persecution that's coming to them here in Philadelphia. But these are Messianic Jews. These are people very connected to Judaism, but they also are embracing all of the kingdom of God and what Jesus is bringing to them. It goes on to say the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. You see, these are all Jewish references. This is another reason that we understand that these are prominently Jewish people in this city uh, and in this church. These are Jewish references to the Davidic kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament. These are direct references to to Isaiah itself uh, as a, a prophetic book. And so when we see this, we recognize that, well, the Jews would call the Father, God, the Holy One. They would call him the true one. But see, now you have this group who's calling Jesus the Holy One and the true one. And they're saying, no, 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 no. Only God is called the Holy One and the true one. And they said, we know it's Jesus. And therefore now they are against those Messianic Jews themselves. And so we know this and we move on to the next verse and it keeps unraveling for us to help us understand what this church was like. Jesus says to them, I know your works and behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Nobody gets to shut that, no way. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. <clears throat> I wanna pull out this phrase, open door. Open door simply means it's an open door to the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, you have an open door to the kingdom of God. You have seen it, you're experiencing it. And I think about, you know, our home here in Northern California with the heat, the way that it is. And very often at nighttime, the house will be heated up and we turn on a whole house fan. 
Man, that feels so good. When you open that back door and it just draws in all of the cool of the outside and it brings it on into the inside. And as you stand in the path of that door, you're feeling the wind and the breeze coming from outside to inside. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, the kingdom of God you're experiencing right now is like breezes from the kingdom into your temporal world. And as you stand in the path, you are receiving these amazing breezes and they refresh you and they cool you. They actually give you energy. And yes, you and I as followers of Jesus, the people of Philadelphia, you're experiencing the kingdom of God now. That's God's promise to us. Jesus said, I am the kingdom. I've come, I'm coming, and I will come. I am the kingdom of God. You are the kingdom of God wherever you go, whatever room you walk into. You are meant to be that fresh breeze, that refreshing that comes to other people. They experience the kingdom of God through you. And Jesus said, hey, we've got this open door. But listen, when I stand on this, this side of the door, I can see into the outside and I can feel the breezes coming through from the outside, inside, and I'm experiencing it. But Jesus says, but here's the thing. It's almost like uh, what you're experiencing now is really good and it's really full. But when you get to the outside, there's so much more. And when you compare the two, what you're experiencing now is like a fresh breeze and that door is wide open for you to experiencing even now, but it's just a glimpse through to the other side. And I love the fact that Jesus, ever faithful and in and among the churches, he says, I know you and I have not left you. I have not forsaken you. Even through the trials and the tribulations, I was there. Oh man, can you imagine when Jesus is gonna meet us eye to eye and he's saying to the church at Philadelphia and he could say it to you too. I was there when you were challenged and the temptation was so strong, but you stood strong. Oh, I saw it. I saw it and I commend you for how you responded and you followed me. I wanna encourage those who are new to our commitments to Jesus. And there are many who are new in your, in your following of Christ and truly making a dedication to Jesus with your life. And you wander through the trials and the temptations and the challenges of life and just living day to day in this culture following Jesus. And you wonder, is it worth it? Is anybody even seeing this? Because I don't have family commending me. I don't have friends patting me on the back and saying, man, you're doing amazing. Does anybody even see this? And we need to hear the words of Jesus, just like to the church of Philadelphia. He is encouraging them saying, I see it. Maybe your friends and your family from the synagogue, people that you were connected to, they're not giving you that encouragement now, but I'm here to give you that encouragement. I see you because I am the Jesus. I am the God who stands among his churches and I am proud of you. And I think about those of us in this generation that we are following Jesus and what does it mean? What does it mean to stand strong? What does it mean to have this open door and to continue to walk through it? It means that we are gonna hold our ground in integrity. It means our, we're gonna hold our ground when it comes to sexual morality, work ethic, our marriages, purity and singleness, choosing character over the lack of it. Oh yeah, Jesus sees it all and he wanted to remind them, oh yeah, I see it and I can't wait to commend you for it, church at Philadelphia but he can't wait to commend you and me either. We need to hear these words as each one of these churches, they all end with the same thing. All let all of the churches hear what the spirit has to say. Let, you, let yourself have an ear to hear it and to respond to it. Now we move on in the passage and it says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, strong language, who say that they are Jews and are not but they lie, behold. And he says they are Jews, but they're not. What is that phrasing meaning? He's simply meaning they claim to be people of God, but they're clearly not because they didn't even recognize me. 
I am God, I'm Jesus, I am their Messiah. And yet they don't even recognize my own words to them. They don't recognize my own presence in every word that I've given them, that they have memorized, that they study and that they teach. They don't even recognize that I am the fulfillment of all of those. I am the ever-present word of God. No, 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 they are not Jews, the people of God. No, 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 behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. I have loved you. They have told you that you don't, you don't receive my love, that I don't love you, but I'm here to tell them that I have loved you. The synagogue was hostile to these Messianic Jews. They were worried about what Christians, how their connection to Judaism and following Jesus as the Messiah, they were worried about how that might impact them and their own persecution. And maybe that Rome would come down hard on them because of the Christians. And so they came down hard on the church itself. But it would be Jesus who will say, Oh, I will see a day where they will have to acknowledge that you were my bride and my love for you is unfailing. I love that Jesus just continues to encourage them and acknowledge the difficulty that they're in. And then he goes on to say, because you have kept my word with patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Oh, I am coming soon. Oh, I think it's a really good word for us to recognize at this point, to remember that our blessed hope is the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. And and we think about the second coming of Jesus. What is his promise to them? I think it's so interesting. And this is definitely one of the things that as we talk about end times, one of the questions that is out there that lingers as we talk about end times is where will the church be when the great tribulation comes, when that that outpouring of tribulation and trial, trial is another word for tribulation, When it comes to the earth, what's gonna happen? What's gonna be with the church? And Jesus, I believe, is telling us, along with other verses as well, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth, that's coming to try those on the earth who dwell on the earth. But listen, you have been so faithful to me, and those who are faithful to me, I wanna keep you from that because this isn't for you. This isn't why the tribulation exists, is to, is to try you. No, 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 you have walked with me and you have been faithful to me. And this is why when I read this passage, I am encouraged greatly about the coming of Christ, that the great tribulation that is coming to our world at whatever generation it comes in, I do believe that the church will be saved from that. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. In other words, that reward when you stand on that podium, that prize for winning the race. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Now, very often we read words like this in scripture and we think, man, that's a lot of stuff going on. Does it really mean anything? And we need to recognize that actually all of it means something and it meant something deeply to the people, the church at Philadelphia. The first thing I wanna pull out of that is this word conquer, this word conquer. This word conquer means conquer. (laughs) That's, That's what it means. It means I will not be defeated, but that I will conquer whatever is trying to defeat me. And I think of Romans 8, 37, which says, despite all of these things, these hardships and difficulties in our life, it says overwhelming victory, not just a little scraping by, no, no, no. Overwhelming victory is ours even for the church at Philadelphia that is undergoing persecution, difficulty and trials from people that they used to call brothers and sisters. 
He says, even though overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loves us. And I am convinced, Paul says, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Someone needs to hear that today. Nothing. You're putting something up and you're saying, but what about this? But what about that? And God is saying over and over and over again, nothing, nothing. Nothing means nothing. When you look at the list, there's nothing on it. When you got a page in front of you, it's blank. There is nothing that can stand against God's love. It doesn't get in the way. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Man, don't we have a lot of those worries about tomorrow. I get it. I'm tempted to have those same worries. And I do have those same worries. And I give in to some of those worries at times. And Jesus is reminding them why. Well, I think he's reminding them because they are also giving in to some of those worries. And they are severely tempted to give in to those worries and let those worries be the storyline. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Your headlines today are not the headlines you need to be paying attention to. I'm telling a greater story and I am getting you to that greater moment when I have the last word and I have the last action. And I will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. He says, no, 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 no. No worries, no fears about today or tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God. No power in the sky above or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate you. Nobody, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And it is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, I used to think before COVID, when I would read these passages where the word conquer would be used, and specifically this one, I think I might have shared this before, but I think it bears repeating. I used to think of this this picture where Captain America is standing on top of this hill and there's not a hair out of place. He doesn't have any marks on his uniform. He's standing strong and the wind is whistling through his hair. He looks as handsome as ever. But I have come to realize that that is not the picture that we are given here. And that's not the picture of the Church of Philadelphia. That is not a relatable picture. What is a better picture is Captain America standing on top of that mountain and his hair is messed up. And the truth is he's bloodied and is bruised, but he is standing on top of that mountain even though he is tired and he's exhausted because he has been fueled by the Holy Spirit from the beginning of that climb all the way to the top of that climb and he has conquered in the name of Jesus. But yes, it took all that he could give And Jesus made up all of the difference and he would have conquered everything that was coming against him. Guys, we know that this life is so difficult. And when we read about the church of Philadelphia and all of these churches and the persecution and the challenges that they endured, we know that Jesus says, but I am with you, I am among you, and I am there to fuel you. My Holy Spirit and his presence is there to empower you to walk in my ways and to walk with me as you would follow me and my teachings through every street and every avenue because that is what I've called you to and I know that you can do this. You are a conqueror. Jesus uses this relevant imagery in here too. I want you to see this. This is so, so amazing. You see, Jesus is always in touch with his people and this is actually somewhat unique to the church at Philadelphia. And so uh, when we pull out this imagery of the pillar and how he says, I'm gonna write your name on that pillar. You see, in Philadelphia, what they would do is they had this custom where they would take favorite sons people who are prominent, people who were heroes from Philadelphia, and they would put their name on columns. Now, they had a lot of columns in Philadelphia because, remember, it was Little Athens, meaning there were so many temples and buildings that were built in the name of Rome and for Rome. Well, they would name 
these pillars after these prominent people because they wanted to commemorate them. And Jesus says, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a pillar in my temple. That's what I'm going to do. The temple of my God, meaning the Father. I am his son, and I'm going to make you a pillar. And on the pillar, I'm not going to write your name. Uh, that na- pillar's already got your name on it. I'm going to put the name of my God. And so I'm going to do this for you. And so the people in the church of Philadelphia, what they heard was, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor you and I'm going to do this for you. And they knew exactly what he was saying when he said this. And he also said, never shall he go out of it. You're going to be in my temple. You're going to be with me and present with me. And he says, never will you have to leave it ever. Now, what did that mean to them? Well, it actually meant something to them because see in Philadelphia, remember I mentioned that it was on the edge of a volcano? And so there were tremblings and tremors, uh, earthquakes on a pretty regular basis. But what they were getting out of the ground with the crops that were being produced was worth the danger. And they believed that it was far enough away that they could leave when the earthquakes started before the volcano would come down on them. So they literally built this city at the edge of this volcano. Well, what was happening on a regular basis is when those earthquakes would happen, people would pack up their things and they would leave the city. They would flee for safety. In fact, we know that many prominent people in Philadelphia were wealthy enough to have houses outside of the city that they could go to because they actually used them that often. And Jesus says, hey, I know you're coming and going all the time, but when you come to the kingdom of God, no, you're not gonna have to leave it again. No, 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 you get to come and you get to stay. There's nothing that's gonna draw you out. Oh, I've got you covered. Jesus is making this amazing point to them that we should hear for ourselves, but he's doing it with them in a very relevant way. They will not have to ever leave. Jesus is their stability in an ever-shaking environment. And then the verse goes on in a passage in verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I love that. He's saying, please listen. Please listen. It's so easy when we have things that are said to us that we know hit home. It's so easy to just say, I don't want to hear that. We don't want to listen. And so we put up our defenses. We put up our guards immediately. And we're like, no, you're not going to get in there. You're not going to talk to me about this. I really don't want to hear this. But this phrase has been used in each of the churches, and it's there for a reason. And he's saying to any of these, hey, you're doing so amazing. Oh, you're doing so good. I have no corrections for you. But if you're thinking, you're thinking of giving in starting to listen to what those other people are telling you, that you're off course and believing them, I want you to know, don't do it. I'm challenging you, don't do it. I'm encouraging you today, don't do it. Stay with me, walk with me. And because they listened to the Spirit, Philadelphia was one of the most strategic cities, one of the most strategic cities that the gospel could be taken further into the world from Europe. It's an an amazing city because it's right on one of the most prominent highways of Rome that would leave Europe and go into the rest of the known world. And because Philadelphia's church was so strong, there was literally an open door for them of ministry because people were coming and they were going and they were finding Jesus and then they were leaving and going back to their homes And they were sharing the hope of Jesus there. And the kingdom of God was leaving Philadelphia and it was going into the rest of the known world. And he says, hey, because you're following me, you actually have an incredible opportunity for ministry that so many other people don't. And he says, this isn't an open door for you. You think you have little power? You think you're just this small little church that can't do a lot? Well, I want you to know the opportunity for you is incredible. And because of you, many throughout the world will be able to hear the hope 
that is found in Jesus. And I think of the words that Jesus gave to his church in Acts chapter 1, 8. Oh yeah, you will be my witnesses in the whole world. It starts in Jerusalem. It's gonna reach past Samaria and you're gonna go into the ends of the earth. Well, Philadelphia was one of those places that right now was stretching the kingdom of God's influence and hope of Jesus further to the ends of the earth. These are the words Jesus wants to bring to all of the churches. Oh, I just think about that. When we think about, again, our thread for today, Jesus wants to commend all of us. That's what he wants to do. These are actually the people who received it. These are the people who received it. Well, what is it that we know about them? Well, you know, there's an amazing uh, parable, and we're going to be wrapping up here in just a moment. But there's an amazing parable that's found in the Gospels, and specifically when I look at Matthew chapter 13, I won't read through the entire, the entire parable, but it's the parable of the four soils. And Jesus talks about when the gospel goes out and the seed of the kingdom of God goes out, it, it finds itself falling in all these different places. It falls on the path, it falls on shallow soil, it falls on, on, on rocky soil, it falls on soil, and then there are weeds that crowd up around it. But he says, he says, but, but, there's also a soil. There's this tender heart, and he calls it good soil. In verse 23, he says, the seed that fell on good soil, it represents those who truly hear and understand God's word, just like he's been telling us at the end of each of these churches. They understand God's word, meaning they seek to understand God's word. When you don't know what it means, you seek to find out what it means. And they produce a harvest 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. He says the worries of life, they don't crowd out. No, 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 you keep, you keep cultivating that garden in the shallowness of your faith. That's not what's gonna take you down because you refuse to be shallow. You will dig deep and make sure that your soil is deep enough that your roots can grow down. And even when the sun is at its hot, hottest part of the day, you have roots that are bringing nourishment to you throughout that time. Oh yeah, you're the good soil. And so we think about these people. What do we know about these? Well, just these last couple of minutes, I'm gonna just give you these. These are gonna be quick. But here's what we know about them. So often we think, man, being a Christian, it can be so complicated. When you read through all of these seven churches, man, it just kind of sounds complicated. It's actually not very complicated. Jesus said, just keep cultivating the soil of your heart. Keep it good, keep it deep, keep it strong. And when you see a weed Take it out immediately. Well, that's represented in the list that's before you. It's in your notes. I'm just gonna read through these. Here's what it says. They gave their lives to following Jesus, heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what God told us. He said, I just want you to follow this commandment. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What we know is they were willing to stay in the hard conversations with each other over the years to work out those disagreements. And I want to reiterate, I want to reiterate for all of us who are Christians, wise Christians will understand that social media posts aren't changing anybody's mind. They're only bringing division. But what we can do, what we can do to be proactive is to invite people to coffee, to a lunch, to a conversation, even if it's 10 to 20 minutes, it's still so much better than just posting something and being misunderstood. So I hope a lot of invitations are going out as we see controversies around our life. Let's just look for those opportunities to be able to share and to have conversations that would honor Jesus. We also know that these are people who kept their hearts and their minds clean. Hey, I didn't say they were perfect by no means, but they did keep their hearts and their minds clean. Now, when we clean the house, we divvy up the chores, and my chore is to sweep. And often I think, there's really not much here. I'm always surprised that there is a pile of things, dust, 
that just has collected throughout the time, or the last time that I swept, which is at least once a week. And I gotta clean that up. But you know what? That's what we do. You take care of it when it's small. You keep your heart and your mind clean. And that's why we walk with Jesus daily. And that's why we spend our time in the chair daily. We also know that whatever opportunities presented themselves, they stepped into them to share Jesus. If it was only for three minutes or if they had three hours with somebody, whatever the opportunity was, they stepped into it. We know they walked with Jesus daily and they kept themselves encouraged. Who in your life is helping you stay encouraged in Christ? This is so difficult to do alone. I'm asking you not to do it alone. Jesus was not speaking to one person in each of these churches. He was speaking to all of them so that they together could encourage one another. Who in your life encourages you? Hopefully you're connected to a life group. Hopefully you built some friendships so you can reach out, ask for prayer and that encouragement. Let them know I'm feeling weak today. Pray for me, strengthen me, and then allow them to do it. Allow them to do it. So we recognize in closing that the revelation of Jesus that unravels the knots in my mind and my heart, and we know that Jesus wants to commend you. He doesn't want to pick you apart. He wants to commend you. And can you hear the coach in your ear? Can you hear him encouraging out your remaining strength? Can you hear him acknowledging the difficulty that you're in? Can you hear him reminding you of why you started this race in the first place? All those good reasons, they're still good reasons. And will you hear him as he helps you visualize the end of this race, the point he's bringing us to, the greater story being told in the kingdom of God, which is the moment of Revelation 20 when Jesus will bring the last word he will bring the last action. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you today and we are grateful that you have shared your heart with the Church of Philadelphia. And we hear this for ourselves as well. And we know that God, you are encouraging us. And that's how we would want to receive these words to us today. I pray that we would be encouraged and that, God, we would be able to see at the end of this race what this is truly all about, and that we could see that open door of the kingdom of God, feel the breezes of it now, and recognize this, as powerful as it is in my life today, is only a breeze that's coming from the reality of what I will experience on the other side of that door. So, Father, I pray that we would feel the refreshment of the Holy Spirit's wind of the kingdom of God today. And, Lord, for those of us who are struggling, who are about to make a, a decision, the Lord would, 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 would undermine all the work that you're doing in our life. I pray that you will help us to give us the strength today to turn from that decision and to walk closer to you Lord, I pray for incredible faith as we get to live this incredible, exciting life at your side. And I pray, Lord, for anyone today who would say, I want to open my mind and my heart to Jesus today. I want to become someone who is a follower of Jesus for the rest of my life. If that's you, just pray this simple prayer with me. Thank you, Jesus, for going to a cross forgiving me of my sin because you went to that cross in my place. You paid the price of my sin on that cross when you went to it. And now I ask that you would forgive me. And Lord, I know that you do because you've already told me that that is your heart's desire so that our relationship can be restored. Thank you for cleansing my mind and my heart as you would come like a flood into my life. Thank you for being present with me from this day forward. And thank you, oh God, for your incredible gift of eternal life. And now, Lord, I commit my life to you and to your hands for the rest of my days. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. 
And whether you're online or in person, can we say amen and amen? Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes, and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. And we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness. And we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope and joy through the restoration ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as, as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you.